proposed classes <laughs> 10A and 10B. We have a panel consisting of Michael Weinberg from Public Knowledge, uh, Dean Mark from AACS LA, Bruce Turnbull, Council of DVDCCA, and Matt Williams, Nicole Brewer, not representing the Joint Creators and Copyright Office. Uh, is that the order we'll go in? But I see you from left to right, or is it? Okay, good. Uh, Michael, you can start off. I don't know if the only one who's it's the first time up for all these panels all day. I feel bad for you guys. You've been here the better part of three days. Thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, Michael Weinberg and I testify today on behalf of Public Knowledge in support of Class 10. Is that a good goal you want? By any measure, DVDs have been wildly successful, with billions sold since their introduction in the late 1990s. The hundreds of consumers who wrote to you in support of this exemption were a sample of American households, many of which own dozens or even hundreds of motion pictures on DVD. <clears throat> These DVD owners make up some of the movie industry's best customers. Those customers are frustrated with technical protection measures that stop them from making legitimate personal copies of those motion pictures. The customers who wrote to you, who represent millions of similarly situated Americans, simply want to be able to watch their movies in a way that makes sense for them. They do this every day with the music they own on CD at the click of a button. But DVD CSS makes what should be a simple task illegal. Fortunately, this proceeding gives you an opportunity to change that. Let there be no mistake. There is nothing illegal about personal space shipping. In one of the few cases to directly discuss personal space shifting, the Ninth Circuit, citing the Supreme Court in Sony, describes space shifting music for personal use as, quote, paradigmatic, non-commercial, personal use. That description is just as applicable to the practice of copying motion pictures from DVDs for use in personal devices. And it is a description that is widely accepted by the public and industry today. I will not repeat the extensive fair use analysis from our comments in these opening remarks. At this time, I will merely remind the office that personal space shifting is a non-commercial, potentially transformative use of a work that has been released and sold to the public with no cognizable negative impact on the value of the work. Tellingly, opponents have been unable to point to case law suggesting otherwise. The closest case they've been able to find, umgvnt3.com, considers a business purchasing recordings on CD and making them available to the public, not consumers accessing recordings they have purchased themselves on devices of their choosing. In fact, there are very few cases addressing the issue of personal space shifting. This would be unexpected if there was a legitimate case to be made against the practice. After all, personal space shifting of a variety of media is widespread and has been for over a decade. And, as we all know, large content owners, including those represented here at the table today, have never been shy about enforcing their rights when they feel there's been a violation. However, they've avoided bringing claims against personal space shipping. In fact, the RAA, one of the joint creators and copyright owners represented today, told the Supreme Court that personal space shifting was, quote, perfectly lawful. Similarly, the MPAA and the RIA have extensive commercial agreements with Apple and its iTunes platform, which builds one-click space shifting functionality directly into its software. The shortage of case law is no barrier to the register granting this exemption. As the register has recognized, the statutory requirements to evaluate exemptions necessarily requires a degree of independent examination. The statutorily mandated process of consulting determining, weighing the likelihood of future impact, and recommending all require the register to draw conclusions beyond the black letter of the law, which the register has done in previous proceedings. Furthermore, the register's recommendation does not prevent rights holders from litigating the issue. If a court were to find non-commercial personal space shifting to be an infringement, the existence of the exemption would offer the infringing party no protection from a copyright infringement judgment. 
Beyond the question of the underlying legitimacy of the use, the statute presents the register with a number of factors to consider in evaluating the requested exemption. In this case, all relevant factors weigh in the fact in the favor of granting the exemption. The first factor, the impact of the exemption on the availability of the copyrighted work, has traditionally been evaluated with a three-part test, considering the actual impact on the availability of the work, the availability of the work in other formats, and alternative means of access. As the register recognized in the previous rulemaking, widespread access to CSS circumvention tools has caused no discernible impact on the willingness of copyright owners to embrace DVD-based distribution. In our current world of one-click CSS circumvention, it strains credibility to imagine that granting this exemption would have any impact on the availability of works on DVD. Additionally, while some motion pictures are available in non-DVD formats, 10 years of DVD-first distribution has created a huge number of works which are only available on DVD. In the case of works that have been re-released in formats that might allow some sort of personal space shifting, it is unreasonable to require consumers to repurchase motion pictures they already own simply to make a legal use of the work. As for the third part of the text, we saw and heard in earlier testimony that alternative means of access are inadequate substitutes both in output quality and in burden on consumers. Using either camcordering or screen capture to create a high quality reproduction, which are by no means exact reproduction, is a technically complicated process that is time and computing resource intensive. When compared to the one-click copy that most consumers use to space shift music, the technical complexity alone excludes millions of Americans from this perfectly legitimate activity. Even if a consumer overcomes the technical problem, the result is an imperfect, inadequate copy. Image quality matters to average consumers. High definition televisions are not only sold to media studies departments. Movie studios do not spend hundreds of millions of dollars on sets and special effects in the hopes that a documentarian will include a clip in their next film. The PBS documentary image quality standards described in the earlier technical demonstration are expensive to maintain, but they exist because average viewers can tell the difference. Poor quality images can fundamentally change a motion picture. The second and third statutory factors, which consider nonprofit and critical uses, do not directly apply to this request of exemption. However, there is nothing in the language of the statute to suggest that impacting every element is a prerequisite for granting an exemption. The fourth factor considers the impact of the exemption on the value of the work. As mentioned briefly earlier, and discussed extensively in our proposal and reply comments, this exemption will have no negative impact on the market for the value of copyrighted works. It will not contribute to piracy. It will not somehow confuse consumers. It will not add to the supply of unauthorized copies of works. The Register has recognized this in the past, and nothing has occurred to alter the soundness of that conclusion. The fifth statutory factor is simply any other factor that may be relevant to the proceeding. In the 2010 recommendation, the Register formally recognized what had long been obvious. CSS is being used predominantly to prevent reproduction, not control access. As a result, socially beneficial, non-infringing uses are being used adver to be adversely affected by the prohibition against circumvention. That was true then, and it is true today. I'd like to conclude with an observation. The Register and Copyright Office would do a disservice to itself and the public if it failed to recognize the true state of affairs with regards to motion pictures released on DVD. This exemption is not about piracy. CSS has been cracked for well over a decade. Movie piracy, piracy is widespread, a fact that many of the opponents of this exemption spend a great deal of time and money pointing out in every available forum. There is no latent infringement capacity waiting to be unleashed by the registered recommendation. This exemption is not about confusing the public. People spaceship media every day and are capable of understanding the difference between spaceship media they own 
and illegally downloading media that they do not. This exemption is about restoring the rights of consumers who play by the rules. It simply allows consumers who have lawfully acquired motion pictures on DVD to spaceship them for personal use. Restoring this type of ability is precisely what this proceeding is designed to do, and I urge you to do so. I look forward to answering your question. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dean Marks, on behalf of AACSLA, the Advanced Access Content System Licensing Authority. And here, uh, just to make two very limited and brief points. Um, first, as we have said with regard to a number of the other requests for exemptions filed in this proceeding, we want to emphasize that requests that do not specifically name new break disks or the AACS technology cannot be granted with respect to such this and technology. And that includes the request filed by public knowledge that is the subject of this panel, and also one of the requests filed by an individual. And this was noted in our comments in February, but I wanted to be sure we put that on the record for the testimony here today. Um, second, with regard to the handful of requests from four individuals who wish to make backup or convenience copies of content, where the request did refer to Blu-ray discs for AACS technology, AACSLA notes that none of these requests state with any specificity that the AACS technology is impeding an identified authorized or fair use. None actually provide the necessary explanation of why the use is an authorized use, and that such use is not able to be satisfied due to the presence of AACS as an effective technological measure under the law. And none of them state the kind of specific, narrowly tailored class that the register has stated is required for an exemption. Accordingly, we request that each of these re individual requests not be granted, at least as to AACS technology and the rate tests. And I'm happy to respond to any questions on the copyright Thank you. Bruce. Um, I'm Bruce Turnbull, uh, representing uh, the Copy Control Association, uh, same organization we were yesterday, uh, for the record. Um, and here, <coughs> I I'm start out with a proposition that I think the proponents have not met their burden of demonstrating that the uses are, um, in fact, not <coughs> uses. Um, we can get into that, and, and right now I have more to say about that. I want to spend my time on, on three points that DVDCCA has First, that the class is not uh, the narrow, refined class that the Copyright Office has stated is, is essential uh, to the granting of any exemptions. Second, that granting an exemption of this scope and breadth um, would overwhelm the CSS licensing system to the great detriment not only of the CCA, but of the movie industry that has relied on it, um, the integrity of the licensing system for nearly 15 years, and the consuming public who have enjoyed DVD um, as a format that period of time. And I'll uh, have some points to make about how public knowledge, uh, I think, was construed, uh, points related to that uh, in, in their responding comments. On um, third, um, the ways in which content is now available and will be available in the next few years satisfies the desire to have content available on a wide uh, variety of devices. First point, uh, the proposed class is precisely the kind that the Copyright Office has considered and rejected uh, in previous rulemakings and the kind that the office warned against in its initiation notice in this current proceeding. Um, to take a couple of points from the initiation notice, um, the Copyright Office said a class of works was intended to be, quote, narrow and focused on a subset of broad categories of authorship identified in Section 102. That was quoted in the Commerce Committee report. Um, second, again, the initiation notice, the goal is to fashion an exemption that is needed to narrow or too broad to immediately address the evidence of present and um, likely harm. Um, it shall be an appropriately fashioned exemption will assist users and copyright owners alike by temporarily suspending the prohibition on circumvention for appropriately tailored, adversely affected classes while preserving the prohibition on all other classes. And our, our view is this would effectively not preserve the prohibition on the rest of from uh, the 2006 um, rulemaking, there are a number of points, and, and this is what we've got up on this 
screen here is a comparison between what the register found and the librarian found to be an unacceptable class and what is proposed here. Um, in, in relation to the effect on criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research, the proposed class is premised uh, for personal performances unlikely to have any beneficial effect on reporting, teaching, scholarship, or, or research. So we obviously does not meet that uh, category. The, uh, the fact that uh, circumvention uh, on the market for or value of a particular class of uh, copyrighted works. Um, the, what was found unacceptable was broad exemption, uh, all motion pictures on DVD, uh, potentially harmful to copyright owners and would adversely affect the public and undermine the incentive for distribution of digital copies of motion pictures and audiovisual work. And that's precisely the category here. Um, Um, in the 2010 uh, rulemaking, uh, the, the office talked about uh, proposals that were narrowly tailored with regard to discrete set of users who had demonstrated a sufficient need to circumvent DVD access controls for limited non-infringing purposes. Um, and No proponent had demonstrated the need to circumvent in order to copy motion picture in its entirety, and no proponent has demonstrated the need to use a quantitatively large percentage of motion picture. And again, um, we think these are comments that were well taken um, from the prior uh, proceedings and were, were reiterated as part of the uh, um, initiation notes in this proceeding. <coughs> Furthermore, the kinds of considerations that were discussed previous panels, various gatekeepers uh, in, in the professional filmmaker context, other limiting factors in the uh, bidder panel, uh, made quite a, quite a bit of discussion about various factors there, um, are conditions that are ensured, designed to ensure that an exemption is not misused. There's no um, suggestion of, and we couldn't come up with any suggestions of, those kinds of limiting uh, factors or gatekeeper roles that would be present when you're talking about circumvention that would be used by the entire population. Um, and here, uh, we believe this is a classic case of the exception to swallowing the rule. Uh, we would not have the kind of narrow tailoring that the Copyright Office has required in prior proceedings and is set forth in the initiation notes. Now, with, with regard to the, the licensing regime, uh, we cited uh, particularly the uh, Kaleidoscape case in our, in our comment. Uh, the aspects of the Real Networks case is all, are also uh, relevant here. In the Real Networks case, the, the court found that CSS technology is still effectively controls access to DVD content for the average consumer. Um, the notwithstanding what the Weinberg had to say um, about the, the status uh, of the CSS technology, it has been recognized by courts as still being effective. Um, in the Kaleidoscape case, the harm to DVD CCA was found to be from the space shifting Kaleidoscape product, um, which is a form of the kind of space shifting that's proposed here. Um, the harm was to the integrity of the CSS license agreement, and, it, and that harm was sufficient to support an injunction against the distribution of the Kaleidoscape product. So not only was there a finding that the Kaleidoscape product um, was a violation of the agreement that the CCA had with Kaleidoscape, but, rather, but in addition that the harm to the integrity of the licensing system was sufficient to justify the injunction. Um, and the, and that, that, again, I think is precisely the kind of space shifting that is proposed here, and we believe the kind of harm that would occur to the DVD CCA uh, licensing system. Um, the third point I wanted to emphasize, and, and I think we're going to see a little video on, on, on this in a minute, um, but I wanted to emphasize from DVD CCA's perspective, the various alternatives that are in the marketplace today that allow consumers to have um, movie content in a wide variety of devices from a wide variety of sources, some of them stream, some of them download, some of them uh, copies uh, that they've made.
made. Ultraviolet is probably the preeminent example that's, that's out there in the marketplace and growing today. We saw the tech demo uh, about Ultraviolet from Mitch Singer on May 11th. Um, digital copy is also uh, prominent on, on with, with many, many uh, movies that are distributed in, in this point, particularly Blu-ray. Uh, there are an array of sources uh, uh, of content available through online distribution mechanisms of a variety of kinds. Um, these are uh, alternatives uh, to the uh, circumvention that the proponent uh, suggests. By the way, I would note that we are not suggesting that screen capture or video recording with your cell phone are alternatives uh, in this case. We would not recommend those as uh, for the purpose of uh, capturing an entire work. Those were demonstrated and, and indicated in our prior uh, testimony as alternatives for clip copy circumstances. Um, we don't um, propose them uh, here. Uh, finally, um, as we discussed yesterday, while DVD remains king, um, it, it has 75% of the physical product of movie distribution still uh, on, on DVD. And the, however, the market for DVD and maybe the overall home video uh, uh, entertainment market is in decline. And our concern is, is very much that, that this kind of broad-based consumer exemption available to every human being in the country um, is, would contribute significantly to the further decline and the more rapid decline of the DVD uh, marketplace. So thank you, and we have to answer any questions. Thank you, I'm Matt Williams. I represent joint creators and copyright owners. Uh, I will be brief because we're at the end of the day, and because, as Bruce said, uh, the proposals we're here to discuss have been raised and rejected in every cycle of the proceedings since 2000, including the last cycle in 2010. Um, some things have changed since then, and some things have not. Um, so first, what hasn't changed, uh, and that's the case law. Public knowledge has not cited any case that was issued since the last cycle show the law has changed since the registers previously considered it. Space shifting uh, is clearly distinct, for example, from search engine thumbnail copying as in Perfect 10 or in Arribasaw. Uh, that involved publicly available search engines, so it's completely different. Uh, I wanted to give some quotes from cases that public knowledge relies on because I don't think the cases really support their position. So in Universal versus Sony, uh, the Supreme Court said the purpose of copyright is to create incentives for creative effort. Even copying for non-commercial purposes may impair the copyright holder's ability to obtain the rewards that Congress intended him to have. Uh, similarly, in the Perfect Ten case that public knowledge relies on, the Ninth Circuit cited the wall data versus LA County Sheriff opinion for the notion that using a copy to save the cost of buying additional copies is not a fair use. So I, I just don't think um, the, the burden can be met on in fact non-infringing. There may be some instances of space shifting out there that I don't think has been identified in the record that could qualify, but uh, the burden has not been met. Uh, second, another thing that hasn't changed is the rules and purpose of this proceeding. Um, first on that, convenience is still not a valid reason for an exemption, yet public knowledge admits it seeks an exemption, the primary purpose of which is to avoid inconvenience. The last sentence of their reply comments expressly says so. Um, they say if the exemption is granted, quote, the only thing that will change is that consumers will be finally able to make use of motion pictures on DVD the same way they make use of musical works on CD, as works they have lawfully acquired and are free to move to whatever personal device is most convenient. So they're expressly, I think, just challenging whether convenience uh, should be grounds for an exemption, and, and I think the ground rules should remain as they, they always have been on that point. Um, another thing that hasn't changed is that one of the ground rules is that uh, providing consumers with the most cost-effective, uh, excuse me, cost-effective method consuming video content, that's not grounds for an exemption. So public knowledge is objections to small payments for different levels of access, um, that should be disregarded. Um, so now importantly, what has changed, uh, I 
think the factual record on the marketplace availability of movies and television shows has changed significantly. Uh, the record shows that much has developed in the marketplace to undermine the position that space shifting should be presumed lawful or that an, an exemption is needed. Content is available in more formats pursuant to licenses. Uh, and public knowledge acknowledges that this is undeniable in their comments. Uh, copyright owners are exploiting existing markets and developing potential markets without exception. Um, the record includes more testimony from studio executives than ever before on this point, uh, in addition to our written comments. Uh, the record also contains more testimony that the security of access controls is critically important for licensing these new services. Public knowledge has introduced no facts to rebut that testimony, uh, despite having the burden of persuasion. Uh, this proposed exemption would undermine revenue streams for new services. Uh, these services are enabling the very means of access public knowledge aims to champion. This is not about people paying twice for the same access, but about paying for different levels of access. Copyright owners can offer different levels of access at different price points because the DMCA enables them to do so. This benefits consumers who prefer limited access at reduced prices without depriving other consumers uh, who want en enhanced access and are willing to pay increased prices. Buying one copy of a work simply does not transfer a license to copy the work as many times as one chooses. Uh, this is the foundation of copyright law in all sectors. And I want to read a few more quotes from cases uh, just to underscore that. Um, in the Napster opinion, the Ninth, Ninth Circuit said, impact in one market, here the audio CD market, does not deprive the copyright holder of the right to develop identified alternative markets, here the digital download market. Uh, in the opinion, uh, Mr. Weinberg, uh, noted, uh, we cited UMG versus MP3.com. Granted, the, the case is distinguishable in some respects, and we wouldn't say that it's dead on point, but th there are relevant statements in the opinion. Uh, and for example, the court said, defendant argues its activities can only enhance plaintiff's sales and subscribers cannot gain access to particular recordings made available by MP3.com unless they have already purchased or agreed to purchase their own CD copies of those recordings. Any allegedly positive impact of defendant's activities on plaintiff's prior market in no way frees defendant to assert a further market that directly der derives from reproduction of plaintiff's copyrighted works. Um, finally, in the Sony versus Tenenbaum opinion, uh, which is an opinion that, that generally I would not endorse as, as having my, my favorite articulation of certain points of law, but I think on this point um, uh, is relevant. Um, there the, the judge said, defendant claims that copyright law does not protect what he labels an outdated business model, and that the plaintiffs have other means of profiting from these works. What he seems to be arguing is that even in the era of file sharing, the plaintiffs still make enough money from their copyright. But the sufficiency of the plaintiff's profits is not the measure of fair use nor is the defendant's view of what amounts uh, of profits are enough relevant to fair use. Congress has not capped the revenue that a copyright holder may derive from its monopoly, and that is indeed a quintessential legislative judgment. Um, now, public knowledge claims that some titles available on DVD are not available in other digital formats, but I, I don't think they point to one single such title in the record. Um, so this failure forecloses reliance on that argument, in my view. Um, and, and finally, although I think there's absolutely no grounds for creating this proposed exemption, uh, I do want to point out that the proposal itself lacks contours. Uh, the proposal does not define space shifting, does not properly limit um, the proposal that owners as opposed to lawful possessors of copies, for example, renters of a copy. Um, and again, although public knowledge says at times that this is about titles that are not available in any format from, but DVD, um, it's not limited its proposal to such titles, um, and there's no evidence to support that such titles um, are causing consumers any concern. Um, importantly, I want to emphasize that 
My clients recognize that their customers seek to access content on multiple devices. They are striving to provide such access through licensed and secure methods, working with technology partners to create new services that benefit consumers. The registrar should not undermine these activities by recommending the proposed exemption to the librarian. Uh, and we want to play a, a very brief video that just describes some of these new services just so that the, the record has a sense of what's out there. It's true, we do want to play it. <laughs>
simply note the rest that consumers will be confused by this exemption because it actually restores the world the way that they think it is right now. Hey. <laughs> well, I'm going to let Chris handle all the CSS stuff. I wanted to make one point on the, the fair use of, of, of the personal copying, which is just to remind the panelists, if you need to remind anyway, but in the, the once case that really dealt with this in the context of the audiovisual work, the Sony Betamax case, it was very clear and the court made clear in one of its footnotes that the premise was this was for time shifting, where the copy of the work was made for later viewing and then erased and not uh, a space shifting copy, which presumably is kept permanently for, for viewing on alternative devices. And I think that there's a dramatic difference between the two. Okay, let's give Michael a chance to respond to that. Yeah, I think there is, there's certainly a difference between time shifting and space shifting. And I guess where I'm going to expect fundamentally disagree with the rest of the panel here is that the lack of case law specifically endorsing space shifting does not suggest to me that space shifting is not or cannot be a fair use. And furthermore, I think, as I, as I mentioned in my, my testimony, the reason that there is no case law on it is because it is an activity that is so far from objectionable that rights holders have not seen fit to bring cases against people who are doing it. Bruce wants to make a point, then I think we may be ready to go to the video. Bruce? I think the reason there's not um, case law, or a reason there is not case law on this, is because of the fundamental difference in the, in the product market. The, the, in, the, in the video realm, the product market has been based on the licensing regimes, CSS, AACS, um, the, the regimes that are set up for, for uh, access from, from various uh, distribution networks would be the cable or online distribution where the machine that receives the pro product has to obey certain rules, the same way in CSS and AACS. That's been very different from the music market where the music was distributed on unencrypted, um, open, so you didn't need a license in order to get access to it. And so the, the device is developed in a very different way and the, and the computer program is developed in a very different way. In the, in the video market, where the devices have strayed from the license terms, Kaleidoscape, Real, um, they have been sued. And, and it has not gone on, on a fair use analysis because the issue had to do with the contract and the, and the violation of the DMCA. Um, but the case law, I, to me, I think it, it's fundamentally because the device and product makers have made their products in accordance with the license and the distribution terms um, that have been put out there. And so there haven't been, the, the, you can't go into Best Buy and buy a device that allows you to make a copy of a DVD. They don't sell them. You can get them off of the internet on websites that, that various people you know, are downloading from. I'm not, not disputing that, although the reason you can do that is because of the way the internet operates and, and although the cases were brought in the and, and, and you know, the, the, both, both from a, a, a trade secret standpoint and from the DMCA standpoint, cases were that those, those should not exist um, uh, under, under the DMCA or, or, or the uh, uh, contract. But I think the case law has not developed because of the way the devices have, and, and the studios have chosen for you know, whatever reason, perhaps good reason, watching their brethren in the, in the recording industry, not sue individuals um, uh, who have who have perhaps made uh, copies of, of movies. So, what do we know about the practice or non-practice in the marketplace of individuals making personal copies of DVDs? Is it a widespread practice? Is there anything in the record that tells us one thing or another about it? I, I can certainly say that there are two points I need to make. One point in the just digital service that has recently launched at Walmart. Uh, Michael referred to and that was referred to in the testimony on May 17. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback from, from, from it. There have been YouTube testimonials that have been referred to of consumers saying that they this was very easy, this was very convenient, and um, we have not heard testimonials from people <coughs> saying, I'm doing this anyway, why would I ever bother to 
Well, it certainly wouldn't be testimonial. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, when the, when the announcement for the Walmart service was, was made, I put up a, a blog post that was probably one of our most viewed blog posts. Not surprisingly, um, it was not as positive as some of the YouTube <laughs> testimonials about it. And it was syndicated very widely with, with, with outrage about that forcing people to pay to have the service. And again, you know, we are, we're basically now stacking up you know, some number of YouTube videos versus some number of angry blog posts going the other way. My point isn't that one is larger than the other, but I would say that there are, in, in many quarters of the public, there has been a fairly negative reaction to this as a service being offered. Okay, but, but back to my question. Do we know anything about the general practice among the public with respect to making personal copies of DVDs? Well, I think there's two points. I, I, I don't have statistics on this, but I think <coughs> two, two things are, are relevant. One is that for many, many people, watching a movie once is just fine. And so, and, and, as compared to music, where, where you're likely to want to listen to it over and over. You're in a small children, do <laughs> Well, there, there are some exceptions. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but you can watch it over and over and over again if you have the DVD. But, but, but being able to make a copy of it for, for lots of purposes, I mean, if you rented it at the you know, store or whatever, you, you wouldn't necessarily care about. Um, the second thing is that until relatively recently, and it's not, I, don't, I don't mean in the last six months, but until relatively recently, the file size of the movie, if you were going to try to make a copy of a DVD, you, you were making, you were, you were going to take a considerable amount of space on whatever storage medium you had. And so, and so the, the proposition of, of doing that was something that, that many uh, consumers you know, wouldn't want to bother. So, so I think that the you know the recent phenomenon of of all kinds of different devices of of the of having lots of storage space is is something that the mar market is reacting to. That's where the ultraviolet you know comes in. That's where where the the, the availability of a variety of different ser uh, services comes in. And so and so the the market is responding to what may be an increased or relatively new demand for availability of movies on different kinds of devices because uh, up to now the devices didn't exist and, and the file size was such that you didn't want to clog up your system. Okay. So the, reason, the reason I keep asking this question is that Michael has made a point, I don't necessarily accept it, but I at least want to attest <coughs> that there's a perception among the public and a practice among the public of making personal copies. And uh, uh, while I don't know there's evidence in the record about this, I think we all probably understand that with respect to music, that's probably true. So. Uh, I guess I'd like to know what Michael knows about the practice uh, or not. Yeah, um, it, it probably won't surprise you to hear that I don't have extensive <coughs> stats on, on the practice that is now um, illegal to break the ERA. So I don't have numbers on it. What I can tell you is, in, in part of our reply comments, we included <coughs> hundreds of comments from people talking about how they, they <coughs> want to be able to use this type of thing they want to be able to do. And some of them is, yes, they have children who love a, 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 a some subset of movies. And they want to go put those movies on iPads when they travel, they can hand the iPad to their kids. People who do, do traveling between, there was someone, one person here who said they have, uh, as they described it, 27 linear feet of DVDs, and that they travel to a summer house and they would prefer to be able to have their, their, their movies on a hard drive or two instead of five boxes in the back of their, their car. You have people who have all sorts of, uh, I would encourage you to, to look, at, look at the record and see the, all the strange Personally, uh, unexpected specific pieces. We have a, we have a, um, uh, one of my colleagues has a nephew who's autistic who loves this like, very small this, this number of movies, and so they want to be able to load them on an iPad so they can give the they can give the nephew the, the iPad to just sort of let him be comfortable and calm now without having to keep switching things in and out. And in terms of the public perception, it's funny. Uh, I have again, I have three kind of very short data points for that are that are that are anecdotes. Um, the one is, of course, the, the Mitch Singer one that was included in our comments, talking about how, how comfortable he was with the idea of being able to put movies on his on his PC, presumably without without authorization. Maybe he did. I don't know. Um, the other one is when we actually when we sent out an email to we sent an email asking people to to tell um, to tell you that they wanted to be able to do this, and we actually got a I got an email back from someone taking me to task. Um, and I was trying to read three sentences. I rarely complain about your articles. 
Usually you have verified the facts, but in this case, clearly you have not. It is not illegal to break the lock on these DVDs. This is someone who, who saw what we said and was so mad about it, they decided to, to write us in anger. And the last thing is, is um, Daryl Issa, Representative Daryl Issa, did an Ask Me Anything on Reddit, which Reddit is an online community, and so an Ask Me Anything is when you go on there and, and the community can ask you anything, and you know, it's, it's a better or worse idea for various public officials, but he decided <laughs> to do it. <laughs> and um, and you know, Daryl Issa is a is representative who I think we all can recognize is someone who has a higher than average interest in intellectual property. And so a uh, Reddit user, uh, Loon Dog, asked, as you sit on the subcommittee on intellectual property, competition, and the internet, perhaps you could explain why I can't legally make visual copies of DVD for my personal use. Are you working to change this? And Representative Issa responded, you can in fact make personal copies for your own use. A good example would be ripping a DVD so you can play it on your iPhone. <laughs> that use is not prohibited. <laughs> I mean, so we have to think with authority now, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's take a break from the questions and let's, uh, let's uh, watch your presentation.
versus what the impact is on the, the purported fair use. And in those space shifting situations that are licensed by content owners and licensed with increasing frequency, they satisfy the need for, for space shifting that consumers want while still providing adequate protection for the content. And so these are alternatives that are here that don't involve circumvention. And I think the notion, and, and the circumvention that would, there's no way you can grant an exemption to circumvent for space shifting and prevent the rent brick in return for the I, I, I would have not heard any notion of how that, that sort of damage could be could be put aside, not, not even talking about, about, about piracy um, from, from, from that sort of exemption. And, and I sort of feel the argument about, well, I own it, so therefore I get to add more functionality to it as it comes along without having to pay for it. It's really a specious argument. When people bought DVDs, they knew they weren't allowed to copy them. The, 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 the devices that they had, as Bruce referred to earlier, really make copying either impractical or impossible. Now that that's available, doesn't mean you get it for free. If I bought a cell phone that didn't have texting, and then Samsung came out with the next version of the cell phone that had texting, doesn't mean I get that cell phone, the next Samsung version, for free. And so I, I just think this the fact that I own that particular copy means I get to make more, I get to do more functionally with that copy. I, I just don't let me address a few things. Um, first, just quickly, the reference I made to Apple wasn't uh, to this, this these, these other music services that is rolled out. It was merely the fact that you can take any CD and put it in iTunes and rip it to, to an MP3 file that has no DRM. That's, that has been built in iTunes since the beginning. There was no, I don't know, I can't imagine they could have licensed that ability as sort of a carte blanche um, situation. You know, if, that ability to do that is, is part of that software. They do not have a license for it, unless I'm very wrong on that. Uh, but that's, that's, that's a fairly small point. Um, in terms of, of these services that were mentioned here, I think there are, there are two reactions to them. First is that the selection on any of these services, or even these services combined, when compared to the universe of movies available on DVD right now, is incredibly limited. You're talking, and this is anyone who has who has sought, who has searched for a movie on you know, Netflix or Amazon Prime or any of these has, has probably had this, this situation. But it's, it's it's true. There are all sorts of films that are not available. I um, again, I, I've not done a systemic study of this at Public Knowledge, but I did on Friday afternoon just send out a request to, uh, to, to the staff and said, "Tell me about movies that you have that are only available on DVD." And it was. It shocked me, and they didn't because we were all out of the office at the sinkhole and, and closed us down, but how quickly I got responses back. Um, a, lot, a lot of people talked about movies that were kind of foreign documentaries or about uh, other foreign films. A lot of TV shows are only available on DVD. Apparently, most anime is only available on DVD. And I actually went home, and I only own uh, 19 DVDs. I'm not an avid DVD collector. But even the 19 films that I own, which I did not purchase in order to get a good sample of movies only available on DVD, three of them were not available in any other format. So these services, even if they were adequate, would not, would not cover a huge corpus of DVDs and motion pictures that are currently available and that people own. But in terms of the ones that are, I think these services are inadequate. First of all, because they do essentially require you to repurchase things you already own. I just, it's not something that I believe that the Copyright Office should, should stand behind and that the law actually allows. And the other thing is that a lot of them require internet connections. And that's, that's something that is not going to work in a huge number of situations. One is because, for better or worse, and a huge part of what public knowledge does when, there, when, when we're not here at the Copyright Office is try to increase access to high-speed broadband and that access just isn't what it should be in this country right now. And in so many cases, that access is limited by fairly restrictive data caps. And so it simply isn't possible, even if you have that high-speed connection, to download full movies with any sort of regularity. You do one, maybe two a month, depending on what your connection is. So these are, just, these are not real substitutes 
for being able to take media you already own and simply make a copy. I think ultimately what we get back to with this, and this is a, the word that we've been used a lot today and yesterday and, and last week is balance. Right? I mean, we could say in order to in order to space shift a movie, you have to go and buy the movie the rights to the movie from Universal Pictures for hundred million dollars. Right? And any, anything else is inadequate. But no, you know, we say, okay, you could buy the DVD, and then you could also buy it again on iTunes, and maybe you could also pay for a Netflix subscription. We're talking about kind of a scale of, of balancing things, a balance of hardships, whether or not this is worthwhile. I mean, you know, is, is paying two or three or four dollars to copy a DVD uh, the same thing as being kicked out of your house because this, the, the government wants to turn into a highway or something? Yeah, we're, we're working at a, at a completely different scale. But it is an inconvenience to consumers. And so you balance that inconvenience against the cost of that inconvenience to rights holders. And what I haven't been able to figure out is what that is. I haven't figured out how to finish the sentence if the Copyright Office allows people to make personal uses of movies they already own then the day after that happens, X, the, the, the bad thing. I, I, I cannot figure out what harm is done by allowing people to do this. So I cannot figure out how much evidence to give you because I don't understand what I'm balancing against. Because the idea that it's going to increase piracy is frankly ridiculous. Piracy exists. The idea that people are going to become confused about the legitimacy of using media is also ridiculous because they already think this is the case, so we live in that world already. The idea that we are going to prevent rights holders from reselling movies to people they already own, that they can already have, make the use of, but for this, but for this law, doesn't seem valid to me. So I just I don't understand what we're balancing the hardship on consumers of yet. Right. Well, a couple of gestures. Yeah. Okay, so uh, yeah. if I could just quickly, I think. First, um, on this huge corpus of titles that aren't available online that are on DVD, I, I don't think there's one title in the record where that's demonstrated, and I may have missed it, but if it's in your comments, I, I missed it, and so I, I just don't think that can be the basis for bringing the exemption. On the question of, you know, what is the harm, I think there, there's somewhat of a misunderstanding uh, or, or a misnomer uh, going on you know, when you buy a DVD, you, you are buying uh, the right to access that copy. Um, but all these great services that are being developed that provide access in very different ways to multiple copies, to streaming copies, to, uh, you know, access in multiple locations, uh, that's a different offering, and it's sold at a different price point. And the fact that it's sold at a different price point enables my clients to work with technology companies to develop these services that benefit the consumer at the end of the day. And so I think the, the harm that, that you're unable to identify is clear to me. It's that um, copyright owners and their technology partners offer products in, able, in order to recoup investments to fund the creation of new products and new services. So without that ability, the new service is dry. Yeah. Two points. First, first is that the, the kind of, as I said in, in my opening comments, the kind of space shifting that is proposed here is exactly the kind of space shifting that that DBCCA has spent a lot of time to, <laughs> to, um, to, to make sure that its licensees are not able to do under the license. Um, it is exactly what Kaleidoscape um, was, was doing um, with their product. And the basis for the licensing, the integrity of the CSS licensing system depends on the ability to enforce those terms. And an exemption of this kind would make that very hard for us to do. The second point is, is that um, he mentioned the, the sort of rent or borrow written in return model, there is absolutely no way to, to police or, or ensure in any way that, in fact, the person who makes the copies 
owns the DVD. The, the, the whole premise of the DMCA came about when Hollywood was looking at it, it was at the very time that, that um, CSS was being developed, the DVD was being developed, and the, the concern was fundamentally that, that you may sell one copy of a work and then, then everybody in the world would be able to make copies and, and you wouldn't sell any more copies of the work. And, and this is absolutely a concern with this, with this exemption request that, that one, one DVD on the block and all of a sudden you know, everybody has the right to make a copy of it. And a lot of what was done, I mean, we, we used a mantra which, which some people criticized and, and had its limitations, but the notion of CSS being a technology that keeps honest people honest is, I think, the reality in today's world where people who are not honest um, can go on the internet and find a, a, a way to, to get around it. But people who are honest know by the barriers that are put in place by the technology that they're not supposed to be doing this. You've completely obliterated if you grant this exemption. So, Michael, when I read the language of your proposed exemption, I think it does, in fact, permit someone who rents a DVD, or if I were to borrow a DVD from Rob, it's a lawfully made DVD and it's lawfully acquired. So, by its very terms, it would allow people to make copies of those. Is that intended? And if so, can you justify it? Yeah, so let me, let me address the, the, rent, the rent return issue and answer that question. Um, if when you made, if you, if you bought a DVD and you made a copy with the intention of taking that DVD and returning it, you would not be making the copy for a personal use. You'd be making the copy to, to, to fraud the, the store you were returning the disc to. How so? And so you are, you're outside the bounds of the exemption. Well, if you bought a copy and then returned it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. For, okay. if, you, if you're doing this entire process is for the purpose of okay. defrauding the company you're dealing with. You're outside of the exemption. Let's talk about rental or borrowing. So, so, I mean, but, but the same situation. The, when, you're making, you're, when you're making the copy, right, the copy is a non-commercial personal use. And if you're making that copy with the intent of returning it or, or, or returning it either to sale or returning a rental, um, I think that the, the validity of that use becomes a problem. And it's, it goes outside the scope of, of the exemption. I don't follow that one bit. It's non-commercial. Right. Oh, I, mean, I, I paid the price to rent it. It was commercial. All right, I borrowed from Rob. So let me, and let me actually answer this a, a second way. Um, no, because the first way didn't work, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, because no, it's not, because, well, you have, have, you, have you lawfully acquired, yeah, you know, what are you having lawfully acquired? You I rented it, it. I, if I rented it, I lawfully acquired it, cop, that copy. Acquired well, it doesn't acquired mean ownership. That you, you don't have some word ownership in there. You say lawfully acquired. I acquired it lawfully. Okay. Let me, then let me, let me ask this a different way. Um, this, is, this actually goes back to keeping honest people on. Right now, anyone who wants, anyone who has bad intent to do this type of thing is doing it already. The existence of the, of the DMCA is not preventing that person from acting in a bad way. And this is, you know, this has come up in a, in a couple of the different <coughs> of, of the hearings. It is absolutely true that someone could have used this exemption, just as someone could have used any exemption. And it's really important to, to tailor them as narrowly as possible to try and minimize that abuse. You're never going to eliminate that abuse. I think the thing to really pay attention to is, this is what I said, it's really important to recognize the state, the state of the world as it is right now, not as we wish it to be. Right now, the only people who are being prevented from making these legitimate personal copies, and you know, we're having an ongoing conversation whether or not they're legitimate personal copies, but let's assume for, for this statement that they are legitimate. The only people who are doing that, who are people who really, who are being prevented by doing that from the, by the DMCA, are people who really, really care about complying with every element of the law. And so, is this, is granting this exemption going to open a floodgate of people who before the exemption were not interested in, in renting, ripping, and returning, but now feel like it's been blessed by the copyright office? That just strikes me as, as unbelievably unlikely. But if we use your language, we are blessing that. I don't know that you are blessing that. I think you're blessing I people. It's personal. <laughs> but that's language. Why not throw in, let's assume everything you say is true. Okay. 
why not throw in the language when the person making the copy owns the copy from which the new copy is made? I, 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 I would not object to that. Okay. All right, that's a step in the right direction for sure. Right. I, I think you still have the problem of there's absolutely, I mean, in the other circumstances, in the documentary <coughs> circumstances, you've got, you've got um, you know, a, an ongoing industry um, program, you've got a narrow group of people who are, um, Working together on standards of you know, <coughs> you know, fair use, and, and who are conducting the educational programs. We had one of the professors talk about conducting seminars. That, that you're not going to conduct seminars for 200 and whatever million people on 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 you know how this is going to work. There's absolutely no way to contain it. Um, I would just reiterate, uh, as I said in my opening, that you still have the the problem of establishing that it's in fact not infringing and uh, they <coughs> admitted again today that the, the purpose is for convenience and that the only other purpose is to save a few dollars here and there, which I think you repeatedly said is not enough. Right, and when I put the proposition to him, I said assuming everything else you say is true, okay. so I'm, 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 everything else is up in the air. Uh, Steve, do you have questions? Um, I'd like your reaction, Michael, to the notion that this is this would destroy the ability to have limited access models, or the um, nature of DVD as a limited access model. So, the two things to that. First is we, we drew this exemption narrowly. I think one of the things that has become clear in the last couple of days, at least to me, is that movies are being distributed on many, in many different ways, on many different media. And this is not an exemption that allows you to break the program on any medium. Narrowly. So it does not, I don't know, I don't see how it impacts a Blu-ray or a streaming because it's only tailored to DVD. But you said that um, <coughs> if more unlocked copies of entire works are made, oh, that's a great question. Um, basically, saying that this won't impact the market for DVDs that are acquired already. That, that, that um, basically, so therefore, it's not a detrimental effect to the copyright owners. But wouldn't this ability displace the offerings that they're making? So would it have a negative impact? Again, I think that's, that's where you get back to, um, should we recognize these offerings as, as offerings that are legitimate replacements for? But it is a negative impact. Well, it's only a negative impact if you view that positive impact as, as really existing, as, as legitimate. Well, it's legitimate, but does it exist? Yeah, it exists. Okay. But, you know, I mean, uh, again, you could, I think if, it, if we were talking about making clips available to, uh, to teachers, I don't know, uh, do, do the clip services, do they charge per clip when, for, the, um, for education uses and things like that? No, these are free services you can access online. Right. So if those services charge for each clip <clears throat> that educators wanted to use, it would certainly be true that granting educators the exemption would have a negative impact on those services' ability to charge money. But I think the larger question would be, is that a service that, that we want to bless from a policy standpoint? I, I get your point. I do, um, I think I have the answer that when, when you say that you don't understand what the harm is, there is at least some identifiable harm. You question the legitimacy of whether that, um, whether that the benefit is rightfully theirs, but you understand taking something away, that is a harm? Yeah, again, I, you know, I, think, I think we're bringing we're bringing kind of semantics. I think that I don't know that we should recognize the benefit, so you wouldn't recognize the loss of it. But I, yeah, I, I would just say that the, the case that I quoted earlier recognized that that's legitimate. allow 
how people, really targeted people who want to play by the rules, who have purchased DVDs, you know, these are not the pirates, it's the people who are paying for motion pictures, who want to make a legitimate use of it. And the only thing preventing them from doing it is the existence of this, of, of, of the DMCA, which is why we have these exemptions. So I would urge you to look at that as really finding a way to reward these good actors. And it really does not have an impact on any number of bad actors that you could imagine and probably already exist in our functioning out in the world. And with that, we will be happy to say <laughs> we're closing this uh, hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.